Well, good morning, my friends. Hope you're well. Let's uh, flip over to Galatians chapter 5. So we're going to keep going. Last week we didn't have service because the ice apocalypse. Glad we all lived through it. That one inch of ice was devastatingly scary. <laughs> so two weeks ago, though, and really through this whole book, by way of introduction, Paul's been, through the Holy Spirit, instructing us on something super important. And that is that through all of history, uh, it doesn't matter um, whether it was Adam and Eve or Cain and Abel or uh, Abraham or Moses or even after Jesus, that a person is, has always been made right with God by grace through faith. And it doesn't, even, even during the dispensation of the law, uh, after the law, it's always been that a person that trusted God was forgiven by grace. And it's super important. And so in Galatians, Paul is making the argument over and over and over again that the law had its place in humanity. And its place in humanity was to, to govern a theocracy, right? So Israel was a, a theocracy, it was a God-led country, as it were. So it had its place to govern uh, Israel and all the laws of that. But then after that, its, its point was to show humanity how far we are away from what God says is good. And it did that in a lot of different ways, right? Um, some of my favorites are, for example, that God says, hey, when you harvest your field, you have to do it in a circle. You have to leave the corners for poor people to come and pick and be able to eat. And anything, anything that you're harvesting, if you say you're harvesting corn or wheat and you drop some, it was against the law to pick it up. You could not reach down and pick up that piece of corn. That was to be left there so that the, the poor uh, and the fatherless could come through after you and that they would have a harvest that they could, that they could have. So, so God can't say in the law, you know, you're going to love people. But what he can say in the law is, this is how you should treat people. Or if you see your worst enemy's donkey in a ditch, on the Sabbath, you have to help get it out. Again, a, probably a law that we would never enact. Not many of us have donkeys, but also just the fact that the law would tell me that I have to help someone that I don't want to help. Again, so the law couldn't say, you have to love this person. But what the law could demonstrate is our lack of love for people. Right? And that's an important concept because today, and again, it, for, it doesn't matter when it was, no matter what time in history it was, the law was never there to make people righteous, right? That's what Romans tells us over and over again. In fact, in Romans 3, it tells us that righteousness has appeared apart from the law, so separated from the law in Christ. So it's just, it, it, when the law came along, it was never so that we would do it and then be righteous people. In fact, it's, it's the, you know, perhaps you've heard the illustration that when you look in a mirror and you see that you're dirty, right? So you worked out in the yard or, you know, whatever it might be. Maybe you're baking. My daughter's been baking, it seems like, endlessly lately. And there's just flour everywhere, right? <laughs> Including on her. And so when she goes to the mirror and sees all the flour, she doesn't then lean over the sink into the mirror and start rubbing her face on the mirror, right? And if she did do that, would the flower come off her face? No, it wouldn't. All it can do is show her that her face is dirty. She has to get the water and the soap, and then that's how her face is clean, right? And so it is with the law. The law was never designed to make a person righteous. Over and over and over again in Romans, in 2 Corinthians, in Galatians, the same point is made, that it cannot make a person righteous. And in fact, in Romans chapter 10, one of the points that Paul makes about Israel then is that they missed righteousness with God because they tried to obtain their own righteousness through, through the law. So Israel, God's earthly people, failed to achieve, as a nation, not individuals, failed to achieve a righteousness with him because they actually turned to the law to try to make themselves righteous. That's how, that's how important Paul tries to make the message. So then the question becomes after that, well, if, if, I, if I'm not made righteous by the law, then, then how does that work? And, and how, do I, how do I walk with God? And that's kind of where we've been at for these last couple of weeks. Because the, the, what's told us over and over again is that what makes a person righteous is faith in God. And, and what does that mean? 
What does that look like? And uh, how do I have faith in God or, or trust in God? And this is where, you know, depending on where you're at and your walk with God or knowledge of God, this is the whole reason that Jesus came. All right? Since the law couldn't make us right with God, since trying to be better people couldn't make us right with God, how can I be right with God? Well, that's why Jesus was sent here. This is, it's actually kind of a, a great deal. Because think about it. God loves you. It may not seem like that because the world is kind of a crummy place sometimes. seems like most of the time. But God loves you. When he created you, he said, let us make man or humans in our own image. So you were created in God's image. You were created in, in that he has emotions. He has thoughts. He has spiritual life. He created you in that same vein. That he created you, and this is, for me, is, is I, I guess, impressive or encouraging. That he likes you. He likes me. That he finds you interesting. How many times have you, have you thought in your mind and maybe said out loud, that person is not interesting. I don't really like talking to them. Or they, don't, they never say anything that is stimulating. Or what they talk about is stupid. Have you ever felt that way or about yourself, about others? And then maybe attributed that to God? He actually created you, if we look at Adam and Eve, to hang out with him. In their context, it was a garden that he finds your conversation, your input, that the divine creator of music and poetry and arts and nature, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. He created all of it. He created souls and that he finds you interesting. He enjoys your prayers, right? Like some of the, some of the imagery we have for prayer is like an, an angel that gathers like a censer of incense and then brings it before the Lord. And he, and he considers it. Over and over again, things like that he, David says that he, he bottles our tears. I, I don't know, I don't, I don't think we're going to get to heaven and be like, you know, your name on a little bottle there. Maybe it's kind of salty because it's evaporated. But I don't, you know, I don't. But the idea is there that every tear you've ever shed, he's considered it. He's thought about it. So when, when human beings rejected him, Right? When, when we said, eh, no, thank you, we'll, we'll do it better on our own. It's kind of like, like little, you watch little children, and they're like two, three years old, and they're like trying to wrestle. They'll get like, it doesn't matter what it is, like get like batteries out of a package because they want their new, you know, 299 flashlight to work for their birthday or whatever. And they get all frustrated, like, ah, right? And you go, hey, let me help you. And they're like, nah. <laughs> You're like, okay, enjoy the darkness, right? <laughs> He's... He's not frustrated with it. He's not, he's, he loves you. He wants to help us. So when we chose not to do that, he had a plan. And that's the whole thing about Jesus. It's not, Jesus is not a symbol of condemnation. In fact, he himself said in John chapter 3, I did not come into the world to condemn the world. Isn't that incredible? You would think if Jesus showed up, he'd be like, I'm here, y'all, and things are about to get rough. Right? Remember what you said last week? Because I do. You know, I check my list twice. I'm better than Santa. You know, whatever. You, know, you would think that that's how he'd come, to reap vengeance, because that's how we would probably do it. We would show up and be like, I gave you a law like 2,500 years ago, and you've done squat with it. So now I'm here to clean house. But instead, he says, I didn't come to condemn the world. I didn't come to heap shame and guilt on people. He says, I came so that the world through me could have a life. Right? He said there is a condemnation. For the world, that the world is already condemned because of its disobedience to God, but that wasn't his mission. His mission was to save us, namely from ourselves and from our old nature, our sin. So when he goes to the cross, when Jesus Christ lives his life, right, and about, about 30 years old, he starts a public ministry, healing, uh, talking about the value of the kingdom of God, talking about the... the uh, uh, Lesser value of the things that are on the earth and temporality and all these things. He's just speaking truth left and right where he goes. He's kind to people, whether it's, you know, a person who's caught in adultery and brought out seemingly just in some sheets, accused by a bunch of religious leaders. He just kind of chills there, writes in the sand, and, and then says, says, hey, you without sin cast the first stone. That's incredible. Just because I think, I don't know about you, I can't speak for you. But it's really easy to condemn people. 
it's really easy to, to look at someone and say, you're less than. You screwed up too much. You don't have value anymore. And, and here's a woman, that, and honestly, in that particular story there in John, would never have clout or ability to show her face in society again. Publicly shamed by these religious, supposedly lovers of God men. And there's Jesus who says, no, you, there's no shame. Just go and sin no more. I don't, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. So that's, the, that's why Jesus came to the earth. Not to condemn, right? Not to just point out all of our weirdness and our sin, but so that we could be reunited with him. So when he went to the cross and, he's, and he sheds his blood, right? You have the kind of the, the pre, uh, when, he go, when he goes you know, with the praetorian guard and he, he ends up there in the, uh, basically the castle or the, the, the garrison, the praetorium, and they whip him, right? That's kind of a normal Roman thing to do. Uh, and that was done essentially, it's a little bit different than our justice system. They whipped you until you confessed. And then once you confessed, then whatever punishment you were going to get, that's, that's what it was. So that's, that's why they scourged Jesus. Now, Pilate had him scourged because he wanted to let him go, but that's, that's another story. So whether it's the blood shed at the praetorium, the blood shed on the street on his way to Golgotha, or the blood finally shed at Calvary, that blood that he shed for us, it was not a, a blood of condemnation. In fact, the letter to the Hebrew Christians, you know, Jewish Christians who had just gotten saved, the letter to the Hebrews, it even says that Jesus' blood speaks better things than the blood of Abel. So remember, if you go all the way back to Genesis, when God is having a conversation with Cain, Cain and Abel, and he says, Abel's blood cries out to me. And Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? Right, because he murdered his brother. So, so Abel's blood screamed what? It screamed condemnation upon Cain. It called out to God, condemnation on Cain. But we're told that Jesus' blood doesn't speak condemnation. It speaks forgiveness and cleansing. So all those past sacrifices that they did, the, the sin offering, you know, the, the burnt offering, the um, uh, day of Yom Kippur, you know, all those different days, it all pointed to one thing, and that is Jesus and his forgiveness. So that anyone who's looked at that blood, as Jesus said, if, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men to myself. Right? Anyone who has ever looked upon the blood of Jesus, figuratively, obviously for us, but looked upon that sacrifice and understood the forgiveness for, for sin, for who we are, what we do, our moral deficiency, understands, and is, is that's what we would call a saved person. A person who has been saved, who's made right with God. And you have all those awesome words, redeemed, right? To be purchased off a slave block and, save, and set free. Uh, salvation, which literally means to be saved from peril or, or taken away from peril. Justified. The idea that I, when God looks at me, I have no sin before him. Right? Righteous. I'm right with him. That he's, he's equated because of the blood of Jesus that I don't owe him anymore. It's incredible. That, that seems inappropriate to say, but it's what the word means. The idea that God has provided himself or in his son a sacrifice for our sin. Right? So that's, that's the forgiveness. So because that's how forgiveness comes, it's how righteousness with God comes, then if you've done that before, you have to ask yourself, in a sense, what now? What do I do now? So if I don't go to the law, if I don't whip open Exodus or, or Deuteronomy, right, or Leviticus or Deuteronomy, Exodus for the Ten Commandments, Leviticus for the original law, Deuteronomy for the law, it's, it's, it's changed a little bit, but it has to do with them going into the land. So uh, there's more law about uh, once God establishes where the temple's going to be, right? Why don't I turn to those and go, how do I live my life? Or, or just in general right now, how do I, if I'm not made righteous with God just by doing stuff, then how do I walk with God now? And even that, it's a figurative term, right? It's a Christian term. Because most likely when you get up in the morning, there's not like Jesus right there. And you're like, oh, let's walk to the table. So we have these terms, these ideologies that we have for, for walking with God, spending time with God, knowing God, right? So how do I do that? And that's what Paul's talking about. So we kind of jump in here 
in chapter 5, we're going to, for context sake, we're going to read a little bit of what we already did. But in chapter 5 and verse 16, he says this. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So he introduces a, a concept for us, right? That if I'm not to listen to my old nature, the, the nature I received from Adam, and again, biblical terms for that, right? The sin nature, the old nature, the old man, just the word sin, uh, kind of uh, generically. These are all used in the Bible for this idea that when we were born as human beings, we were born with the same nature that Adam had, right? A rebellious one. And it, we, it probably didn't take you too long to realize you had that, or it's not very hard in a child to realize that, right? A two-year-old child would, you know, take the lollipop from you and then kill you if it could, and it wouldn't think twice. <laughs> Can you imagine if your two-year-old was as strong as an 18-year-old? You'd be dead. It's just the truth, because that's how we are. It's just, you know, you're like, you had them the wrong snack, and they want to be like, ah! You're like, okay, get nothing then, that's fine. I mean, <laughs> we're sinners. So he's making this point, and he's saying, look, you have an option now. Because he has given you his Holy Spirit, in Ephesians 1, it says that he's sealed us with his spirit. And it's the idea of a signet ring, uh, like a king puts on a, a dollop of wax and to seal a letter, that we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. You have other things where the, the, his, the Holy Spirit is in you. Um, uh, the, ho the Holy Spirit is upon you. The Holy Spirit fills you. Right? So we have all this imagery in Scripture to point out to the fact that God has attached himself to us and empowered us through attaching his Holy Spirit to our souls. That now we have a conduit in, in the name of the Holy Spirit between us and the Father. Does that make sense? So Paul is now saying that there's a new way and a way that Christians walk. And it's by walking, he calls it walk by the Spirit. And then in verse 18 he says, led by the Spirit. So we can be led by the flesh. Anybody here been led by the flesh before? We might call it temptation. We might call it uh, urge. You know, we might call it instinct. You know, and, and our flesh, as we've been talking about, it will always, our old nature, to sum it up, is, is selfishness, right? It will always protect number one. It will always make sure that number one's feelings are preserved. It will always make sure that number one's money is preserved. It will always make sure that number one isn't harmed by anyone. Right? That's, no matter what, that's, that's the intrinsic reality of our nature from birth, that I matter the most. Right? But the Spirit is different. Right? The Spirit is all about God's perspective, who God is, what God said is good, what, what God said will satisfy us. So for us, we kind of have it. That's what he says. He says that the flesh desires what is contrary to the, to the Spirit. We can acknowledge that, right? That just from the few things the Bible does say, things like, I don't know, love your neighbor as yourself. That's not typically a natural reaction from human beings, is it? I read a statistic once, and I've never tried to verify it because it seems impossible. But it was a historical statistic that in, in all the years, about 8,000 years of human history, that's, that's recordable history, that there's been about 70 years of peace, a world peace. And they take that from different conflicts. They go all the way back to certain, even like Byzantine texts and beyond that and to, to the texts from the, the Fertile Crescent and stuff like that that they've salvaged over the years. That they estimate about 70 years in all of human history that there's been world peace. Why? Because someone's always trying to get what someone else has. Right? And we're willing to send tons of people to their death to do it. Why in the, you know, for example, in the, in the, during the Industrial Revolution, why did the U.S. government have to step in and say, hey, funny story, you can't have 12-year-old kids in your factories that lose an arm. You can't do that. Because people were more than happy to take children, bring them into labor in factories in the U.S., let them lose limbs, and then kick them out the back door with nothing to think about it. They're preserving number one. That's, that's what we do. So we have an option. We can listen to the preservation of ourselves all the time. And that works out in a million different ways, right? In a conversation, someone says something that offends us. As Christians, we have the power to not be offended. We have the power to not respond in kind, right? Because the old nature says, you've insulted me, now it's go time, right? 
I'm going to either respond with something that humiliates you or attempts to, respond to something that insults with something that insults you, insults you, or maybe I'll respond physically, and I'll try to dominate you because what you said to me is it harms my, my ego, right? That's what it does. The spirit never does that. The spirit is always pointing to what does God say is better? What does God say will work in this situation? What does God want me to do? So it kind of filters down in, in almost every decision and every word that we have to make, right? Am I, am I going to listen to the flesh, my old nature, and make sure I'm preserved, whether it's by dominance or recoil or whatever it might be, or is it my spirit? And I'm listening to God's spirit that says, hey, I have life in you. And, and Jesus would go so far to say, if you take up your cross daily and follow after him, you will experience eternal life. Well, the flesh says, no, that's impossible. No, 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 no. Taking up the cross is death. It's not life. But Jesus redefines it and says, no, no, no. When you walk in the life that I have, when we say life, we mean ideas. Um, we mean vitality, fullness, right? ideologies. He says, when you walk in that, that's actually how you find these incredible realities that I have for you, right? The eternal value things. So this is kind of with that idea. Then he goes into verse 19. And he talks about the acts of the flesh. And just note that phrase, if you will, the acts of the flesh. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. I, I think it's always important to point out that witchcraft isn't just like, you know, I'm going to wave a wand around and make an incantation. The, the Greek word there is pharmakia. Right, which probably sounds pretty familiar to us. Pharmacy. That's where we get our pharmacy, uh, the word pharmacy from. And it's really the idea of essentially using drugs to try to achieve or awaken my mind to that which is supernatural. That's what it means by witchcraft. Uh, and, and we see that around the world, right? And, and even in our, in our own country, this, this ideology that if I take shrooms or if I take LSD or if I, there's certain drugs that I can take and it will somehow open my mind to a spiritual universe. And that's true. It's just the wrong spiritual universe, right? It opens us up to invite really bad things into our life. And so he says, look, this is an act of the flesh. The flesh rejects truth as it is in Jesus and then says, instead, I'll, do this, I'll take this substance that will open my mind to something better, right? That's the danger there. So he goes on from there and he says, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So in, in verse 19 to verse 21, it explains to us, this is how the flesh acts. It always acts that way. It's not tameable. Does that make sense? The flesh is not our old nature. It's not tameable. It will always provoke and encourage to those ends. And, and if you look, those are kind of, debauchery means excess. And that's how the flesh brings us. It's always saying, no, you need more. You need, you need more. That wasn't enough sex. Interestingly enough, it says orgies, right? And the law, and the law says don't have sex with animals. Why? Because human beings will lust so far. They'll go so far in their lust, their crave for sexual satisfaction, they'll include orgies, and they'll include uh, the drugs and the alcohol, and they'll include animals. That's wild, isn't it? It's wild. That's what the flesh does. It, one is never enough. It's what the flesh does with alcohol. It's what the flesh does with anything that alters us. It's what the flesh does with Netflix. That's why we binge Netflix, right? Because we watch a show that, that we like, and then all of a sudden, we want to do that for 16 hours. And I, again, I'm not saying, like, you guys better not binge Netflix. I mean, hey, whatever, go watch Lost or whatever it is you're doing. But, you know, it's, I'm just saying that. The flesh is never satisfied. It's not like you watch a good show and go, I need never need to watch TV again. I just watched the last show I'll ever watch because it's just satisfied me. It's never happened. Or food, right? None of us say like, you know what? I had ice cream once. It was incredible. I'll never have ice cream again. It just satisfied me. No, we're like, what ice cream am I going to have tomorrow night, <laughs> right? Or you sneak the bowl you shouldn't have. Like your spouse goes to bed and you're like, yeah, good night. <laughs> and then the next morning, like, where did all the ice cream go? I don't know. Was it the elf on the shelf? You know, whatever. So is it, right? Because that's what the flesh does. So he's, he, he, he's saying here, he's like, this is how it always acts. But check out in verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit. So notice, flesh acts, 
but the Spirit bears fruit. So those are two different things, aren't they? Because an act is just a response to an urge or a response to a thought process, and now I'm going to act upon that. And that's all the flesh can do. It can only act upon its own urges. It can't be delivered from that. But the Spirit does something different. The Spirit actually bears fruit. And it's noteworthy that what, what does it take to bear fruit? Even like a lemon tree, right? A friend of mine years ago got a lemon tree, like a sapling. And in the instruction booklet, it said right in there, it will be seven years before you get a lemon. You're thinking to yourself, like, did they not have something bigger? Like, it feel, I feel like I would have read that before I bought it. Seven years? Do I have to, like, what do I have to do for seven years? Do I have to plant it? Do I have to put water in it? Can I just set it somewhere, and in seven years I'll get a lemon? How is this going to work, right? No, you have to cultivate it, right, to get, to get good fruit. I am a bad gardener. This year, I didn't do anything because I was just discouraged. But in the years past, I tried to garden, and I've gotten some tomatoes here and there and tried some different stuff. Um, but the thing about gardening is you have to invest in it, right? Like, if you, if, you, if, you, if you want actual fruit from a garden, you don't just, like, run outside with your, like your, your bag from Johnny's Seeds and just, like, throw it. And then be like, all right, I'll catch you in three months. Right? You have to test the soil. Is it acidic? Is it too basic? You have to add or subtract certain things. You have to uh, water. You have to, all, there's a, just a ton of stuff you have to do. You have to make sure it's sheltered, right? If you're going to do tomatoes, you have to make sure they have shelters. So they don't get rained on. If they get rained on, they, they mold, right? All those things. All I have to say is fruit, it takes time and it takes investment, right? Fruit does. So the flesh just acts, but the spirit is playing the long game. Does that make sense? When we're trying to sow to the Spirit, as he's going to say later on here in Galatians, when we're sowing or planting to the Spirit, it's little decisions that end up making up a big lifestyle or, or maybe a, a, a big victory, if that makes sense. But it always starts with little decisions. It always just starts with listening to the Spirit. It always starts with uh, considering what God is saying, right? Right? So he says, look, this is, this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is what the Spirit will bear out in a soul. He says it will bear out love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You know, it is good for any human being, but especially believers, to not yell at people when they're angry, right? That's good. It's good if you're angry with somebody, you're frustrated, you don't just go, ah, right? Because you preserve the relationship, you make it easier to reconcile. That's a good thing. But you know what's better than not yelling at someone? Is not wanting to yell at them, right? So there's, a, there's a huge difference there, isn't it? One is good, <laughs> right? One is good. We're into that. But one is significantly better. One can be done with natural power. Just yourself. I mean, unbelievers exercise self-control all the time, right? Because they, like, don't want to go to jail. So you exercise self-control. You don't want to lose a job. So you exercise self-control. You don't want to finally alienate a spouse. So you exercise self-control. But only believers, through the power of God, come to a place where their self-control is because they're just listening to the Spirit. That they actually begin to walk in a way where their desire is to do what God has. That's a supernatural event that takes place through the Spirit. That's why it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not your fruit. Which one of us are going to go home today and go, you know what, tomorrow I'm just going to love everyone, right? Hold my coffee and watch this. I'm just going to love everyone tomorrow. I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to love everyone. I'm going to get up, and no matter what anybody does to me, I will just feel love for them. Not a one of us, right? We hope that. We want that, but the truth is we'll get irked, we'll get offended, we'll have all those things happen to us, most likely. And so what God is saying through Paul is that there is a way in which you and I can begin to be changed on the inside. That's not from us. It's not from the law. It's not from exercising self-control. It's not from going off to a building somewhere and hiding away. Uh, and, you know, asceticism or, you know, whipping myself when I have a bad thought or none of that. That's, that, that's all a joke. Paul says it has the appearance of, of wisdom and of godliness, but it, it does nothing for the flesh. So instead, he says, we're to walk by the Spirit. We're to be led by the Spirit. 
And in verse 20, uh, 24 and 25, he says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And verse 25 says, since we live by the Spirit, so we're saved, we've been given spiritual life, let us also step with the Spirit and let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So he kind of introduces this three times, right? At the beginning, he says, walk by the Spirit. Then in verse 18, he says, we can be led by the Spirit. Then in verse 25, he says, we live by the Spirit. And then he says, we can keep in step by the Spirit. So this is kind of this new life that God is calling us to. This is, in a sense, what discipleship is. This is when, when we're told as Christians to go into the world and make disciples. This is what we're to bring people into. We're not just there to try to force people to have a morning time or read the Bible. We're, we're there to encourage them to get to know God. That's the whole purpose of Jesus coming the first time, right? It wasn't to condemn the world. It was to restore the relationship. It was to bring the person, you, who God loves back to himself so that you and I could begin to walk in what the Bible calls newness of life, a new life in Christ where I am listening and hearing and encouraged and supernaturally strengthened by him, and he is listening and considering and guiding me. Does that make sense? So that's what we're talking about here. And so I just want to turn to a couple verses to see how this begins in our life. If you don't mind, we'll turn to John, John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is just a fantastic uh, in exchange that Jesus has with a bunch of people. Although I guess I wouldn't turn to one of the Gospels and be like, yeah, this one's kind of lame. So <laughs> if I do, you should probably go to another church. But, um, or rebuke me with hot displeasure, as the scripture says. Um, in John chapter 6, it's awesome because Jesus is interacting with human beings. And as you know, interacting with human beings doesn't always go well, right? Um, it's just kind of how life works. And so in this case, Jesus is acting, interacting with big crowds, and he's talking to them, and he's healing with them. His, his, his public ministry is booming right now, right? Which is great. We're super into that. Then he comes to this place, and he, gets, he just kind of has this truth bomb that he drops on them. And it's excellent. And we're not here to be like, yeah, stupid crowds, but we're here to learn from what he has to say. In John chapter 6 and verse 25, it says, When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? So what's happened is, up to this point, Jesus has interacted with the people. Uh, he's uh, fed the people. He's done a bunch of these things. So him and his boys, they jump in a boat and they across the lake via water. And all the people that saw Jesus were like, oh, no, you didn't. And they go, they circumnavigate basically on land and kind of meet him on the other side. That's what's happened. And so when they get to him and they see him, they go, oh, when did you get here? As if they didn't know. So in verse 26, Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for the food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. We'll stop there for a second. We might be tempted to say, well, none of these people must have been believers then. They must have, been all, they must have all been unbelievers. And this is kind of a weird time, right? Because this is what, we, what if, you know, people that are smarter than me call it the intertestamental period. In other words, Jesus is on the scene, but they live in the Old Testament. Does that make sense? Jesus has not died and raised from the dead, so the Old Covenant is still alive and well and being cranked out, right? Meanwhile, you have the New Covenant walking around with you until he finally is crucified and raised again from the dead to enact the new covenant, the new, uh, uh, the ultimate exposure of forgiveness through the blood of Christ. Does that make sense? So in that, he's walking around with people, and he challenges them. And this is a hard challenge. He turns around to them. And they say, hey, when did you get here? He doesn't say, well, about three. What he turns around and he says to them, he goes, you guys are only following me because I keep feeding you bread. That would be hard to hear, wouldn't it? And he says, you're not following me because of my message. You're not following me because of eternal value. You're, not fo you're, you're following me because I heal you and I feed you. And he says, I want, and he challenges them. He says, you need to stop following me for bread that perishes. Right? Instead, he says, you need to follow me for the bread that endures to eternal life. So there becomes this challenge. 
And the challenge is both to, to, to unbelievers and believers in different ways. Right? So the challenge to the unbeliever who's in this crowd, that challenge would be you have to get your mind off the flesh. You have to understand what I'm really doing here. You have to understand the forgiveness of God. You have to understand what I'm doing, right? The challenge to the believer is you have to understand more what I have for you. So the person that's already like, hey, I think Jesus is the Messiah. I think this dude's legit. But he keeps giving me bread, so I'm in. To that person, to the saved person, if we could call him that, he says, you need to refocus your mind on something. Because saved people, and we can attest to this if we're honest, saved people can still live after the flesh, can't we? We can still live and try to make sure we're going to make the most money we ever had, or we can try to live and make sure that we're going to have whatever. I mean, you know what I mean. We're going to live for pleasure. We're going to live for comfort. We're going to live for whatever. We can still do that. And sometimes, as twisted as we are, we will follow Jesus for that. There's whole movements based on that. That if you follow Jesus and you have enough faith, that you'll be rich and never sick. Right? I mean, there's whole movements. Millions of people follow Jesus because they want a good life. And I'm not here to cast shade on any church, but maybe you've experienced it too, where you went to a church or you were just talking to someone and the gospel was, does your life suck? Jesus doesn't want your life to suck. You should come up right now and call it to Jesus and he'll make your life not suck. Is that the gospel? Not even close. Right? The gospel is that we are hopelessly wicked. And God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to pay for that wickedness. So that we could stand to him without any kind of, stand before him without any kind of spot or wrinkle and talk to him and he would he would unrestrictedly be involved in our lives. And we would unrestrictedly be involved in his life. Right? That's the gospel. And so what happens to us sometimes is we can get these weird formulas. And we can go, well, I really don't want my life to be bad. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to go hungry. I don't want to do these things, which are good desires, right? We're, we're not insulting those desires. But if that's my primary motivation for knowing Jesus, he would say this, stop following me for the bread that, 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 that perishes. It's important to understand that over the next 150, 250 years from now, millions of Christians will be killed by the Roman government. And then after about 350, about 450 A.D., millions of Christians will be killed by, I'm not trying to be rude, essentially the Catholic Church as it progressed from Constantine. And then after that, millions of Christians will be killed by Muslims. And it goes on and on, and it still happens today. The gospel has never been follow Jesus and your life will be better. The gospel has always been follow Jesus and your life will be fulfilled because you will have eternal perspectives or you, you can have eternal perspectives. And to understand that the work that he's doing here and the value of a soul is infinite, yours and everybody around you. So Jesus comes to these people and he says, reality check, guys. You're following me because I keep feeds you, but I have something that's so much more valuable. Now, is, is this obscure? Why turn here to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit? Because this is the foundational work, and it's a foundation that you never leave. And it's the foundation that we're constantly coming back to saying, Jesus has the truth. He has what is eternal of value. And so whenever I'm, the, the truth is, in a sense, clouded by my desire or clouded by what's going on in the world, or clouded in some way. The way that I continue to walk with God, when it's, which in itself is a figurative term, the, the way that I continue to hear from Him, and He hears from me, is to stay close to Him, and to reckon His truth every moment as truth. Right? Because our society will constantly tell us it's not. It's a weird thing that occurs. Our society will tell, will tell us instead, you know, if you... Uh, my favorite is the Corona commercials, right? If you have 2% body fat and you're in a bikini and you're drinking beer on a beach, then you're fulfilled. Isn't that what's communicated to us? If you're on the back of a horse and you have a Marlboro in your hand, you're fulfilled. Right? If you, if you go to Burger King and you have it your way, you're fulfilled. Right? Every advertisement appear, it, it, it beckons to the flesh. 
Our whole world is predicated on beckoning to the flesh. And so Jesus is coming along and saying, no, I have so much, something so much better. And its root, the root of its joy, the root of, of, of its fulfillment, has, it has no, it's not on this earth. It's in heavenly value and really in, in God's life. So that's what Paul's trying to communicate here. And it's what, it's what Jesus, he, he, he implements this step to these people saying, you have to make a decision of why you're following me. Verse 28, they ask him, what will we do to work the works God requires? So they're saying, okay, okay. So if, I, if, if, if we're going to get bread that endures for eternal life, whatever that means, because they don't necessarily understand it, we'll see that in a minute, then what do we have to do to get the bread? What works do we do? Kind of like what the flesh said, right? These are the acts of the flesh. And so they're asking, what, instead of what acts do we do to get the bread from you? In other words, what do we do to earn this? And the, 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 the trap of ever thinking that we earn something from God is that when we do that, what we're saying is, you're my debtor. I prayed for five minutes today. That's got to mean a raise tomorrow. I prayed today. I, I went to church today. I, I did this thing that your, your word says at least is a good idea. If not, it says I should do it. And so because I did it, that means that you should do this for me. It becomes contractual, right? And so they're asking that. What can we contractually do to cause you to owe us this bread that we want? And it's interesting because what he says, they say, what do we do? What works should we do to work the works of God? And in a plural sense, what works? He comes back with in verse 39, or 29, Jesus answered, the work of God is this. The work, the singular thing that God has called you to do is to believe on him who he has sent. So he, again, what did he just say? Stop following me for perishables. Right, but ask me for eternal. And then they say, okay, what can we do to earn that? And then he says, no, 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 just trust me. This is the one thing that you're called to do. That's why this is foundational to how we walk with God, because the Spirit is constantly speaking to us, sometimes more than others, and sometimes louder than others. You know, when I first got saved, and I, and I got invited over a couple of people's house, Christians from our church, and invited me over, and I, I went there, and they had Bible verses everywhere. And I was like, this is really weird. Like in my house, my parents had like some art that I didn't appreciate much. Uh, you know, it's like they had like a statue of some dolphins and some whatever, right? Decorations is how I looked at it. But I went to these Christians' house and they had, they had the Bible everywhere. And I thought like, this is lame. This is not really exciting to look at. There's no like picture here. Why do you have all this scripture everywhere? <laughs> Why don't you, I don't know, do something else? And what I began to realize over time, because I, I, I interpreted it as kind of like some sort of religious ceremony thing. Like we have to like value the Bible and so we'll stick it on our walls or something like that. And what I realized over time is that having scripture on your walls earns you nothing with God, right? It's not like he, it's not like he goes, oh, I see you put John 3.16 on the back of your toilet. Uh, hey, you know what? Good job for you. Great spouse for you. Authority at work for you. Right? We don't, we don't earn it. But what it did was it keeps truth in your focus. Right? If you're putting up for the right reasons and you're putting up verses that mean something to you, all of a sudden you're keeping the truth in focus, which is that's what he's asking them to do. Right? He says, do you want to do work? Do you want to do what I'm calling you to do? Do you want to have part with what I'm doing and doing building my kingdom? Do you want to be able to be involved with me and interact with me? Then he says, you have to trust me. So something like verses on the walls earns nothing. But if you're reminded it's on the dashboard of your car, it's in wherever it might be, if you're reminded of his word that it's truth, all of a sudden now it's going to help you to walk in that because that's the foundation from hearing from the Spirit. Right? We, have a, we have the Proverbs, some of the Psalms, we have Ecclesiastes, we have uh, you know, multiple books that are what's called wisdom literature, right? It's just literature that's just kind of like, this is how life works, right? Uh, some of my favorites are 
uh, the greeting of the friend, uh, the, 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 or the blessing of a friend in the morning is a curse. In other words, the Bible says, look, if you're someone's friend and you're waking them up with a blessing, it's actually a curse. Don't wake people up. Don't be loud, even about good stuff in the morning. Right? I love that one. I'm an early riser, so it's not, it's not like I'm you know, upset because people are blessing me in the morning. But the point is that that's just, it's just wisdom, right? So with a little piece of wisdom like that, you might know how to help someone else, or you might avoid offending someone else, right? How about a gentle word turns away wrath? That's incredible wisdom, isn't it? If I actually have the goal in mind that I want to de-escalate a situation, maintain a relationship, or see it grow, a gentle word turns away wrath. So when someone's like, ah, 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 you can just be like, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Maybe we could talk and I could make that right with you. Now, sometimes they'll still respond with like, what? But you've, you've turned it away. You've deflected it. So, so all that to say is knowing truth, reckoning truth, in other words, like tallying it up and agreeing that it's true, that's the beginning. It's the foundation of walking in the Spirit. Because I'm hearing God. I'm understanding here and there. I don't understand everything. What God's saying, and I'm walking in it. So we can take a lot of mystery, because sometimes when you hear, uh, depending on your background, you, you, you think about walking in the Spirit, and it's the idea that you're walking down the street, and like a, a dove like flies out of a blueberry bush, and you know, with like an olive branch in its mouth, and you're like, oh, God is with me. Not really. I mean, maybe. Or I could just fire open the scriptures in the morning and go, oh, hey, look, God is with me. Because he told me. And usually we'll see that played out in our lives, right? Because he's miraculous and he's powerful and he blesses us. So he's just making, Jesus here, he's just making this simple statement. You ha- the work that God is asking you to do, the thing that God's asking you to move forward on, is trusting, really, in some sense, what you already believe. And just bringing it back to recall, bringing it back as truth, right? God works all things together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, right? What's a crummy situation in your life right now? Don't, you don't have to shout it out. But what's, what's, a, what's a situation you wish was different in your life right now? I bet if we went around the room, every single one of us, it, would be, it could be big, it could be small, every one of us would have something we, we would say, I wish this was different. Right? But I can apply faith to that. Because the Spirit has already told me that for those who love Him and for those who are called according to His Spirit, so save people that are walking with God. And you go, well, why is the promise only for save people that are walking with God? Because people that aren't walking with God don't let God work in their lives. Right? So there's always an offer to use for good anything that occurs in your life. But you get to decide if he gets to do it. That's the incredible thing. Because if we go stomping and kicking around everything bad that happens, is that really going to be an opportunity for God to work it out for good? No, it's not, right? We reject it. We don't hear it. We don't have fellowship. We're not listening. So we have these, as Peter says, these exceeding great, mega, great and precious promises that he's given us through his glory and power. It's incredible. So this is foundational. This is how I begin to walk in the Spirit. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. There's many, many, many more passages we could turn to. This is just a snippet to kind of build a foundation. Before we go into, before we go into what the fruit of the Spirit are next week, I just want to talk about how it happens. How does this happen in our life? If it's not by law, if it's not by works, it's not by trying hard in one context, how does it happen? It happens from that work of God to believe on him who he has sent, to trust that that Jesus is going to come through on what he said, to trust that every day that I really am forgiven. Now, just just that one truth, to get up every morning. and, and, And think about some of the imagery that's given to us that our sins are cast into the sea, right? The abyssal trench, as it were, right? That, that our sins are separated from us as far as the east is from the west. So much imagery about that, right? 
that our sins and our iniquities he'll remember no more. So wake up everyone. His mercies are new every morning. Did you wear them out yesterday? They're new today. Right? The mercies can't be worn out, but yet somehow they're still new every morning. So when God tells you that his mercy for you is new every morning, what is he trying to communicate to you? There's plenty more. Right? It's never ending. That's the point. God's mercy never ends to you. If we could just grasp that, right? Just that little, just that little thing that his mercy will never run out for you. He's not like a bad dad that goes, I've had enough. I can't take this anymore. Right? It's not who he is. He can always take it. In fact, in Hebrews, we're told as an application to his mercy that any believer, anyone who's ever called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can come into his throne, and it's called the throne of grace. Isn't that incredible? God's throne is called a throne of grace. Now, there is a judgment seat, but his throne is called the throne of grace. He says, you can come to my throne of grace anytime you need it. And he says, you have the right to come to that. That's crazy. We don't even have the right to go to Pacific County's throne of judgment. Or you can just like walk in there anytime you want and be like, I need some help. Right? You'll just meet a bailiff really fast, probably. I don't know what would happen. But we can walk into God's throne of grace when you need it. And it, when do you need grace? When you screwed up, right? No one screams for grace and mercy when everything's all good. You only ask for grace and mercy when you've, you, you're messed up. You didn't earn it. Because you, you can't earn grace, right? That's what it is. It's unmerited favor. The imagery that we have and, and, and the promises we have and the language we have, and I get it. We could turn to Hebrews chapter 6 and, you know, impossible to renew again, and, and we could talk about those verses. But those verses have to come into focus of mercy being new every morning. That we're saved by grace through faith. Those are the lenses by which we look at Hebrews 6 and 10. Those are the lenses that we look at Galatians, you know, whatever it is, 521. That his mercies are new every morning. So it's just with this kind of incredible reality. And then so Paul says this. Paul, writing to a decently new church, to the church in Ephesus. There's actually some, if you, if you like, uh, the title F, Ephesians was actually added later. If you, if you like nerdy Bible stuff, uh, there's actually a very strong case that this was written to Laodicea. Uh, which would be new, near Ephesus, and later on, when the, the letter was preserved, uh, since it doesn't have an address in the be, or you know an addressing in the beginning, the uh, early theologians thought, well, it must be to, to Ephesus. But anyway, kind of nerdy, fun Bible stuff. But he writes to this church, and he says there in verse fifteen, chapter one, verse thirteen, he says, "For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for uh, all of God's people." I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you, in my, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation so that you might know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you might know the hope into which you have been uh, uh, called. To, uh, excuse me, he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And we don't have time to go through all these things. But briefly, look at what, pray, but what Paul, to this reasonably new church, is praying. He says, first, I, I hope that you have the spirit of wisdom. I'm praying that you'll receive the spirit of wisdom. So we've, we've, we've already talked about it a bit. The earth has its wisdom, right? The earth's wisdom is to make sure number one is okay. It is to prefer myself, right? We talked about how uh, you know, the United States had to learn that, like, hey, you shouldn't let children lose arms in factories for the sake of making more money. Hey, you shouldn't, you know, rip off your workers. Hey, you know what? We need to stop the, the land barons in the U.S. Think of all the laws, for essentially, from about 1840 on, all the laws that came into the United States to stop people from basically being tyrants, right? Because we are, naturally. So he, he, here he's saying, I don't want you to go into the world's wisdom. The world's wisdom is, if I can get, the, uh, you know, enough land and I can put barbed wire around it that I can stop all these little guys from free grazing, then I can make more money with my cattle. Right? That was a real problem in the U.S., right? And the, it, we're all familiar with that? That was a huge problem in the U.S. Because the wisdom of this world is, screw you and your little farm, 
I'm going to make money. Right? And that's kind of universally how human beings work. So he says, no, I don't want you to have that wisdom. He says, I'm praying that you'll have the spirit of God's wisdom. And we talked about the Proverbs and those ideas that there's a different wisdom. And God's wisdom is what does God want and what can be worked out in this situation. You know, one of my, probably my favorite proverb of them all, not that it matters, this, but this is my favorite proverb. It's like, it's like literally the theme verse of life. Which sounds dramatic, but roll with me. Where there are no oxen, the stable is clean. But with much oxen, much work is done. The Bible literally has a proverbs, a proverb that you have to put up with bull crap to get stuff done. Isn't that incredible? That's godly wisdom. I'm not trying to be crass. It literally says, where there's no oxen, if you have a barn and you don't have any cows in it or, or oxen, they're different from cows, you don't have a bull in there to pull your cart to do your plowing, then guess what? you got a clean stable. You don't have to go in there and shovel poop. But if you want to have a successful farm and, and all these different things, you want work to get done, you have to put up with the poop. Literally what it says. And it's, it's perfect for church. It really is. Because the reality is, it's really easy to come to church and not deal with any poo. Just have the stables clean. Right? And if I, if I get offended or I get angry, well, I just eject and I go somewhere else. But if I want to actually see work done for the kingdom, I have to be willing to shovel some stuff. I have to be willing to deal with stinky stuff. I have to be able to throw cow pies outside. It's literally what he's saying. So this is, he says, I want you to have the spirit of this truth, that God is doing something great. And we all get to be a part of it. But the question is, am I willing to deal with poo? Smelly, yucky, sticky stuff that I don't want to deal with. And the promise is, if you do, if you're willing to take steps forward to deal with that in your life, and in the lives of those around you, you're willing to be kind. You're willing to be merciful. You're willing to uh, allow mistakes around you and mistakes in you. And you're culpable for those mistakes that you make. And you're gracious with the mistakes that other people make. Then great work is done. Great work in a relationship. Remember when you had, when you were like 10, maybe, for some of us? And you had like a best friend. Or maybe in junior high or maybe high school. You had like a best friend. And, and with that best friend, you felt incredible freedom, right? Especially in the high school years, if you had a best friend in high school or, or any time in your life. Right? The reason they're your best friend is because you feel like, I can, I can be or do whatever I want, right? I can, I, not, not like permission to be rude and, and, and mean to people or something like that, but you knew that even if you acted the fool, that person would still be with you. Remember that? How secure is that? Because that's what marriage is supposed to be, Right? Like marriage is the person that you sit on the couch with and eat too much popcorn in front of, you know, all those different things. And they stick with you. And so that's, I'm not saying church should be as tight as your marriage, but God's building a kingdom and it's full of broken people like us. And so there's this incredible wisdom where he shares, he's like, hey, you can be involved in something great. But the reality is it's going to have some stinky parts to it. But if you're willing to shovel through those, incredible things can happen. I mean, these are incredible promises. God is so wise. He's so good. And Paul says, as, a, as, a, as this new church, these believers, he says, I want you to consider. He says, I pray for you that you'll have that spirit of wisdom. Then he says, a spirit of revelation. That you would have, a, that you would have the spirit, that God's spirit would be revealing things to you. This is also another part of walking by the Spirit, right? When the Spirit reveals things to you. And I think it works differently for different people because we think differently, we have different emotions. We, you know, uh, so th I think that, well, we have the same emotions, but they come about differently. You know, so I think that, in my experience, the Spirit's going to work differently in each person. And, and, so, and, and sometimes the Spirit works in our heart in a supernatural way, and we just know that we should go do something. Now, that'll never contradict His Word, Right? Because his word is his foundation. It's, it's who he is. But when a spirit of revelation is sometimes he reveals our own sin. Sometimes he reveals other people's sin. Sometimes he reveals plans that he wants to do. Sometimes he reveals, you know, whatever it might be. 
But we're called, he says, I'm praying for you. This is all under the same idea, a foundational reality of walking in the Spirit. Using wisdom, appropriating the truth that he's given us, battling, if you will, for that truth when the enemy of our souls or, or our own heart tries to deny it. Battling for it, right? Taking our thoughts captive, 1 Corinthians 10 says. So that, that same idea with wisdom and revelation then he goes from there and he says, uh, let's see here. I lost my place. Oh, verse 18. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the end of verse 17. And he says, uh, so that you may know him better. So the whole purpose of this is to know him. So what did Jesus tell those guys in John? He said, hey, you're, you're, you have a wrong motivation. And he says, instead, you, your work is to trust me. Your work is to trust me of what I said is true is true. He says there in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Now, again, it's important that the word hope in the scriptures, we'll end here. The word hope in the scriptures is not just desire. I know I explain this every time, but it's because I get it confused every time. Because we just, in our English language, whenever we say hope, we say desire, right? If I say I hope to get that job, what I'm saying is I want this to happen, right? If I say I hope I you know, win this, or I hope that this happens. I'm saying I desire that to happen. But that's not what the word means, at least in, in biblical Greek. It's not what the word means. The word hope means expectation. I expect this to happen. Does that make sense? So when we say the Christian's hope is heaven, it's not we're saying like, oh, I just hope I make it. That means that Jesus' sacrifice was really weak if you have to still hope in that sense to get to heaven. No, no, no. When a Christian says, my hope is heaven, what we're saying, I expect to be there. And I expect it because of what Jesus did. So what Paul is saying here, he says, I want you to have the hope. of You know, he talks about the power, the resurrection. He says, you can expect God to work on your behalf. You can expect his power in your life. You can expect his promises to come true. You can expect his leading. That's what he's saying there. And he's saying, I'm praying that you realize that you can expect God to do great things on your behalf. Because we earned it? No, because he loves you. And he wants to bless you. And he wants to work in your life. And he wants to make you more like himself every single day. More joy, more love, more peace, more of that fruit. That's what he's looking to do in our lives. You know, there's a, a ton of other verses we could have turned to. In James, it talks about the implanted word, right, um, that is able to save our soul. Again, God's truth. And then you have the parable of the, in Matthew 13 and in Luke 8, you have the parable of uh, the sower and the seed. And the only thing that prevented the word from, from bearing fruit in the different ground, we won't go over them all for time's sake, was that the only thing that prevented the, the growth in the stony ground, it had no root, right? So the, in the stony ground, the word falls, uh, into, the, into the, the, the stony dirt, and it sprouts. And Jesus tells us the people whose hearts are stony ground, what happens to them is they, they receive the word with joy. I'm not here to have a debate over who's saved and who's not. I, I would look at it, and some people disagree, that you have three sets of saved ground and one set of unsaved ground. One set of is the, the saved person is the person who has, stony, has the stony um, ground. And it's because the seed plants, they receive it with joy, but what happens is it doesn't develop a root. There's stuff in the, in the soil that's too hard, and so the root, the root can't penetrate rocks and different things like that. So what happens is the sun comes out, which is depicting uh, trials of life, right? And because there's no root, you just get dried out. Because if a plant doesn't have roots, it can't pull up water. When heat comes, it just, it just dries out, and it dies. So the, the point of that ground is, are there things that we're holding on to that's keeping the root of God's word from getting into our heart? Are there things that we're rejecting, things that he's speaking to our hearts where we're saying, no, I will not allow that. I will not give that to you. Well, it's not going to be a surprise if we're saying no and not allowing the, 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 the word to take root in our heart that when difficult times comes, we'll just have freakouts instead. And then we'll get all dried up and we'll panic and we'll, instead we'll have anxiety and fear and depression and all those things. Whereas if I'm allowing his root into my heart, all of a sudden, yeah, there might be a battle, but I realize like, okay, you know what? This is a bummer, but God's doing this, and this is what his truth says. And then you have the second ground. The second ground is fascinating. 
is the thorny ground. And that seed goes into the ground. It sprouts. It takes root. The root goes down, right? So it's penetrating into the ground, into the heart. And it actually begins to grow a plant. But instead of things that are already in the heart or in the ground that are stunting the root, what happens, there's other things that grow up around it. Thorny plants, it says. But these thorny plants, they're outside seeds that have just fallen in the same ground. And as the word grew, these other thorny uh, plants grew and they choke it. They take the sunlight away. You ever seen like a, uh, you know, you live in the Northwest, right? You ever seen a blackberry bush before? You ever watered one? Nope, right? You ever planted one? Nope, right? You, you like you prune and prune and prune, and then you dig up a bulb, and you're like, finally got you. And the next spring, bloop, you know, you're like, oh, right? Blackberries, and they, they take over things. Well, have you ever seen them in the winter when they're all dead, and you can see kind of the skeleton? And they, what do they do? They, they just make like this weird arc, and, it, and it's like this. It just takes all the sun away from where they're at. They suck the nutrients, and they suck the sun away. So in the, in the thorny ground, Guess what one of the things are? This, it's really challenging. It says, the deceitfulness of riches. There's other things too, but the deceitfulness of riches. We still live in the richest country in the world. If you make more than $40,000 a year, you make more than 90% of the world. It's kind of wild. Now I understand it's more expensive here to live and things like that. We live in the richest country in the world. And, and I'm not saying that you're deceived, and I'm not saying that making money is bad. And I'm not saying you should feel guilt if you have a lot of it. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is riches can deceive us. And how do they deceive us? They can make us feel safe and secure, right? If the bank account's full and you think, well, I, could weather, I can weather the economy, or I could do that. Well, we know full well how many times in this country and really throughout the world have you seen profound financial collapse that happened in a moment. They can unfortunately make us feel important. Money can make us feel important. I have a lot of money. I've wrought it with my own hand. I'm an important person because I don't buy clothes at Walmart. You know, whatever it might be. They can make us feel important. They can make us despise others who don't have money. We can look at people that don't have money and go, oh, you lazy. Get a job, bum, right? They can actually make us rude. Like money is it's, it's deceitful. So it's important to understand that if we're going to walk with the Spirit, we have to steer clear of untruths. And we have to affirm truth in our life every time it comes up. And that's how we're going to hear from the Spirit. And it's how he's going to con continue to speak to us. And that's how we'll see his fruit work out in our life. Does that make sense? So next week we'll go into the individual portion of the fruit uh, and, and how in part, like how that works in our life and what it looks like and so forth. We have some communion uh, this morning, and it's an opportunity to remember the Lord until he comes. The bread, remember he told us, he says, this is, represents my body. He says, this is my life. It was given for you. He says, when you, when you eat the bread, he says, I want you to remember that I gave my life for you. Remember, did he come into the world to condemn the world? No. Is remembering his body given to condemn you? No. It's, a, reassur it's a, uh, a reassurance. It's, it's an opportunity to say, it's, it's, it's a, to affirm truth. He gave his life for me. He loves me. And then and the, the, the juice, he says, the juice, uh, you know, we're not serving wine, but he says, uh, 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 the wine, he says, look, this is, it represents the new covenant in my blood. So the old covenant was fulfilled in Christ's blood. In other words, there's a new covenant that, is for, that, that brought about forgiveness. Remember, it's not the new contract. It's not that if you do this, then God does this. It's the new covenant. If you trust him, he'll bring it all about in your life. That he has these great things for you. And so what's the application from all this today? If we are willing, God will bring about supernatural reality and power in our life to have the joy and the peace and the love, right? Primarily, that's going to come from getting to know him to knowing who he is and experiencing him in our lives. The people, we trust the, the, the people that we trust the most are people that we have the most good experience with, right? We can know tons of people, but we trust the ones that we know take care of us, that are gentle with us, that are kind with us, right? That's who we trust. And so we have an opportunity to trust God and to move forward in that.
And so this is just an opportunity with the, with the uh, uh, community to do that. So having said that, I'm, I'm just really bad at time management, and it's 12.01. So if you've got a role, that's cool. I get it. Um, no, no condemnation, obviously. We're going to have communion, have a couple of songs. If you'd like to stick around for that, we welcome you. Um, you know, because we're a mega church, do we have to? <laughs> we just ask that you just kind of come forward and then go around that way. Otherwise, there's all these, like, kind of things where you're trying to slip by, back to people. Um, so please just kind of come forward and kind of go around the back. Uh, if you feel free to go out and take communion in the, you know, the foyer or whatever, um, and just feel free to take it as you feel ready. If you want to pray with your family or individually or, or whatever it is, uh, that's kind of how we've been rolling here. So the Lord loves you. Go out of here in peace. I wish I could say that more. Just seriously, when you leave this place, realize that God is for you. If you have sin in your life, just say, God, I have sin in my life. And it feels like, you know, wherever you're at, if it's got a grip on your heart and you don't want to give it up, just tell the Lord, I have sin in my life. I don't want to give it. I love it. I'm convinced that this is the better way. And I need you to work in my heart. Have a dialogue. Turn from it. Right? Offer it up to him. If you don't have sin in your heart, then go out of here and realize he's for you. He's for you. He's rooting you on. He's not in heaven going like, wow, you're, I'm pretty bummed out with you. He wants to dialogue. It's why he created you, to interact with you, not to shun you and be a jerk to you. Just go out of here in peace. Father, we thank you for your great kindness. Thank you for the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. We confess to you, Lord, that we, don't, that we, that we sin. We do. We love ourselves. We don't want to love ourselves. We can say with Paul that the good that we, would, that we would do, we don't do. And that which we don't want to do, the evil we don't want to do, that's what we find ourselves doing. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for over time that we see victory and fruit in our lives. Thank you for your patience and your kindness, your, um, I don't know, your grit to stick with us and be kind to us. Oh, thanks for the folks here and that are willing to come out on a Sunday and, and, and search for you. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would go with them, that they would be comforted. I pray, Lord, as we remember you, that we'd be willing to consider ourselves and to lay aside our sin and then partake and, and, and rejoice uh, and renounce that you're, you're coming again. And we, we look forward to your coming. Lord, thanks for your mercy and all your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.